Um, anyway, this is our inaugural lecture for the Health Equity Lecture Series um, featuring uh, Perry Halkaitis, who's the Dean of the Rutgers School of Public Health. Um, in launching this Health Equity Lecture Series, this is a joint initiative between the Schools of Public Health, the School of Nursing, and uh, the School of Social Work. Um, and really sort of born out of our shared values across the three schools. Um, for me coming in as a new dean, I have to say, like meeting the people in the other schools and realizing that we have these sister schools that are like share our values and share our goals. It's just, it's been an amazing thing. And so this is a really great um, visual sort of representation of, and a representation of that, that unity. Come on up close to the front. Um, <clears throat> so our goal in the Health Equity Lecture Series is to bring thought leaders to campus. We're working on various different facets of health equity. Um, and the goal is to catalyze conversations about how we can work more effectively with communities, each other, and our partner organizations to bring about positive change and also to foster a more inclusive environment here on our own campus. Um, I wanted to point out for those of you who are going to be at um, the first annual uh, interprofessional LGBTQ um, health conference um, at the University of Washington tomorrow that Perry will also be um, the keynote speaker there. Um, and today he's, he's lecturing to us on promoting health equity locally and globally through HIV biomedical advances. Um, before I turn over the microphone to Perry, um, I wanted to provide you with a little bit of introduction to him. So in addition to being Dean at Rutgers, he's also Professor of Biostatistics and Social and Behavioral Health Sciences. Um, his research examines health disparities in LGBTQ populations with an emphasis on the intersection between HIV, drug abuse, and mental health burden and the biological, behavioral, psychosocial, and structural factors that predispose these and other health disparities. <clears throat> In addition to authoring over 200 peer-reviewed publications, please come on up to the front. Come. Okay. Um, he has authored five, as I like to say, real books, like books that real people read, right? Um, including, he has a new book that's coming out in June, and you can pre-order it on Amazon, um, that's called Out in Time, The Public Lives of Gay Men from Stonewall to the Queer Generation. Um, and so we're exci I'm excited to read your new book. Um, and I also wanted to point out that he's just a great leader in terms of our public health community. So um, for the Association of Schools and Programs of Public Health, ASPPH, which is sort of our, our overarching organization, Perry has been leading this great committee that is working to develop a zero tolerance policy for harassment and discrimination. And our, and our hope is, um, that that policy will then be adopted by all of our schools and programs that are within the association. And um, we spent some time talking about it today. I, I think it's just gonna be a great tool for all of us um, to take a stand in terms of um, what our values are and what we're trying to accomplish and, and a great starting point in terms of um, what are concrete steps that we can take and how we can support each other in making progress. So. Um, Perry, we're thrilled to have you here today. Thank you for everything that you do, and I'll turn it over to you. Um, hey, can you hear me? Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Hillary, and thank you. Thank you for having me here for this for today and for this visit. And uh, it's it's an honor to be here. It's actually kind of fun to come to Seattle and. You know, see people I've known for a long time and students who are now working here at the University of Washington and just sort of like this perpetuation of a, I mean, for those of you who are like going to have your careers because you're all like in your 20s, it's amazing when you move along your careers and then you reconnect with people after all these years and think about all the great stuff you've done together and all the times you went out and party together and all of that stuff. So it's really great. <laughs> Rock on. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm going, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to, do a talk today um, focused on two areas that I've been thinking about a lot. One you know, has to do with biomedical advances around HIV. And then I'm going to sort of flip 
gears a little bit and talk about our cohort study that I've worked on for the last 10 years and sort of try to tie it all together for you in a meaningful way. If I'm hopefully I'll be successful in doing that. Um, the work that, I, that, I, that I've been doing for the last 20 years has been done at a center called the Center for Health Identity, Behavior, and Prevention Studies, which had its um, birth at NYU where I was for 19 years. And I just recently moved to Rutgers a year and a half ago, and, and the center sort of came with me across the river a whole eight miles. You know, but you know, you might as well be worlds apart. So what I'd like to do is talk, give a little, give you guys a little bit of an over, overview about uh, biomedical technologies and consider how we contextualize these technologies with regard to HIV prevention efforts in the United States. Then I really want to talk about U equals U, this whole this undetectable equals untransmittable campaign, which has its roots in these biomedical technologies. And then I'm going to sort of flip and talk about the P18 cohort study. And the P18 cohort study is something that's been really amazing for me. It's a study we've had funded by the NIH for the last decade. It just like ended on March 31st. Uh, we've actually have an intervention we've, we've, we're developing out of it that I will sort of preview for you at the end of this talk. And then I'm going to sort of wrap it up by conceptualizing um, um, a model for sexual minority men's health. And so let me tell you what my premises are as I come into this talk, what I, what, I, what, I, what I believe and what my biases are, because we all have our own biases that we bring. These are my biases. That HIV, and I, as, I, as I've written many times, is as much a social phenomenon as it is a biomedical phenomenon, that there are social, structural, behavioral, psychological drivers that continue to fuel this disease. If that wasn't the case, everybody would have an equal chance of being infected. Everyone does not have an equal chance of being infected in this country, and you know that's true. Number two, and, that, and number two, that um, not necessarily in all parts of the world, but certainly in the United States, this is a disease that primarily affects gay men. So if we think about the gay population as being a part of the population that's three to five percent, I don't know. We don't have any estimates on that, but that's maybe close enough. Maybe it's more like 99 percent. No, three to five percent of the population. Gay men constitute 60 percent of new infections and 60 percent of people living with HIV. That's, as we know, a health disparity, right? And while I have great faith in antiretroviral therapies as a way of managing HIV and managing the epidemic, these medications alone are not enough. And so I'm going to talk a lot today about how we combine these technologies with behavioral approaches and social approaches to f continue to fight this disease. And I had a really great lunch today with the undergraduate students at the School of Public Health where we sort of tossed out these ideas and talked about vaccines and cures and stem cells and how we're going to bring in NTAs. I personally we hear the term end of AIDS a lot in the literature. Uh, right now, we hear it a lot from our politicians, including, including some people who are presidents of our country, or one person who's a president of our country. But I don't know if the medications alone are enough to bring an end to the epidemic. OK, so what do we know? And so a lot of some of this is repetitive for some of you, but we're going to do it. There's close to 40 million people living with HIV around the world. About a quarter of them do not know their status. And you know, anyone will, any, anyone will tell you, and any good literature would support the idea that the perpetuation of the epidemic in our world is not predicated on the people who are tested and on medication, but on those who are tested and untreated, or out of care, or untested. Right? Um, maybe at the end, if I have time, I'll tell you my Ryan Gosling doppelganger story, but I'm going to make you wait for that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but what we know also is that in 2017, about 2 million people were newly infected. And just in case we don't think people die from AIDS anymore, and I'm sure those of you who do HIV work confront this all the time when you talk to people of HIV, and they're like, oh, but, but there's a cure, right? Right? Or the thought that, you, oh, we still have that problem? Right? The fact is that we had close to a million deaths in 2017. And as you know also extremely well, there are geographic disparities in terms of where the epidemic continues to lodge itself with huge, huge, huge problems in Africa. Um, now, what we've seen over the course of the last several years, though, is some shifting of the epidemic with some slight improvement in, um, in the United States and Western Europe, but huge increases in what was this former Soviet Union and huge increases in Northern Africa. And I've, been I've begun to do some work in Greece lately, 
because if you haven't figured it out, my name is Greek. Uh, my parents are actually Greek immigrants. I've started to do some work in Athens where, let me just tell you, the idea of biopsychosocial is like on no one's radar. And, you know, and, and, you know, in thinking about the role that social and structural inequalities play in driving disease, last month in Athens, the largest HIV clinic that's, that tests people in, this, in, the, in the country was bombed, right? Because there is such discrimination in even that part of the world, in part, I think, fueled by the economic uncertainty. For those of you who have been to Greece lately, and I've been there a lot, it's really a country that's ravaged economically. And so you have close to 40% of young people without jobs at this point. So when you have a situation like that, it also often breeds intolerance. In fact, the, um, this is why I never finish my talks. In fact, the Nazi party has 30% of the seats in the, in, in, in the Greek assembly. So there's social structural issues at play there. But let's keep things in perspective and realize that while about 1% there's a prevalence of about 1% of HIV around the world. When we look at African countries, African countries are really where the epidemic continues to be lodged. You know, sort of, for me, reinforcing the idea of the disparities, of the, of the neglect, of the abuse that has taken place in the African continent for centuries, right? Okay, so many of you are lucky enough not to remember life in the 1980s. I do remember life in the 1980s. Um, I was a young gay man in 1981 at Columbia University. I was actually, who was I telling this to? Somebody, maybe it was you, Hillary. I was telling somebody to, um, a story about when I applied to college. I applied to Harvard. I, was, I went to a place called the Bronx High School of Science in New York City, which is a really cool high school. And I was a really good student. And my mother, my mother sixth grade education, Greek woman, um, where are you applying, Perry? I'm like, I'm applying to Harvard. Where else are you applying? Uh, I'm applying at Harvard. Uh, <laughs> and she said, and uh, you know, a week later I arrived from and there was a Columbia University application. And that was a really smart move. So I was at Columbia University in 1981 and just sort of like lived through the 1980s and early 1990s in New York City, which was like devastating in many ways. I will argue also a, a time of great empowerment and a, a time of great activism and a time of people really coming together to fight for something, like the many things we're fighting for now. But the epidemic radically changed in 1996. And you know, for those of you who are around, you'll remember that people who were incredibly, incredibly sick prior to 1996, suddenly, many of them were getting better. And there was a term called Lazarus syndrome that was used to describe this phenomenon of people who were like really, really, really gone, who all of a sudden were on combination therapy there was a new class of medications called protease inhibitors that had come about. It was discovered that if you combine these protease inhibitors with other classes of medications, you could attack the virus in three different locations. And lo and behold, boom, we had heart, now art, and viral suppression that caused a huge decrease in, in deaths. And in fact, the CDC released this report at that time um, talking about the effectiveness of treatment um, and the beginnings of a conversation of how treatment, this is actually the first, I think the very first indication um, of treatment possibly being as also a source of prevention. And so treatment as prevention um, has become a cornerstone of the attempts to bring an end to AIDS in our, in our world. And um, the United Nations and the World Health Organization have logged on to this idea of 90-90-90, where basically we identify 90% of all people living with HIV, we have them on treatment, and we have them virally suppressed. This is a huge, huge aspiration. This means that nine out of 10 people who are living with HIV are not only identified, but they are treated and they're taking their medications. Now, for those of you who know anything about human behavior, which is all of you, you will know that human behavior is complicated. And then when you ask somebody to do something every single day, it's very hard to do it, right? Think about the times you maybe have not finished your antibiotic or not taking your vitamins or not eating properly every day or not, not going to the gym five days a week. I go to the gym constantly, so I don't know missing that behavior. I'm teasing. Um, but when we think about human behavior, we think about all the possible things that can go wrong. And when we think about HIV lives, people living with HIV, I think we have to think about people who are also mothers 
and fathers and lovers and children and who have money or don't have money, who have very complex realities in their lives. They're not just pill-popping machines, right? They're gonna take their pills every day. And so, I say, and so I say to many of my clinician friends who say, I don't understand. Why don't they just take their pills every day? And Jane Simone has been a leader here in this, in this, in this, in this, in this area. Why don't they take their pills every day? I'm like, well, because she's got four kids and like three jobs, and she has a million other more important things than taking her pills every day. And so I think that as we wrap our heads around how to do these interventions, you know, we have to realize that lives are complicated. And we have to realize one of the things that I've said consistently throughout my career is that human beings are not rational operators. Because if human beings are rational operators, you use a condom every time, right? Every decision you make would be the right decision, right? The quote unquote right decision. But human beings are not that. And for a long time in public health and health psychology, we built our models on this idea that people are rational operators, which, come on. <laughs> um, so the goal then is to, over the course of time, um, to deliver proven tools that will have an impact on um, reducing HIV, demonstrate, and then develop these long-term solutions. So what are the tools we have? We have pre-exposure prophylaxis, we have post-exposure prophylaxis, we have treatment as prevention, which gives us the basis for U equals U. And so just a quick little primer here for those who may not be aware. Pre-exposure prophylaxis, that beautiful little blue pill there, and it is a pretty pill, that Truvada pill, it was shown in 2012 um, through a, a trial called the IPREX trial that if, you, if an individual takes one of these pills once a day, um, it prevents them from, from acquiring HIV. One pill once a day, kind of like a birth control pill if you think about it, um, prevents somebody from becoming HIV positive. Now, this is a medication that's used to treat HIV positive people. And this trial, the IPREX trial, showed the efficacy of the use of Truvada in this way. And there's been several studies that have proven its efficacy. Some other trials have shown non-efficacious non results, but that's mostly due to the fact that the, in those trials, people have been non-adherent. So like anything in life, if you don't do it consistently, it's not going to work. So this particular approach to HIV prevention, while an excellent one, also depends on a consistent behavior. Now here is what's troubling. We know that in the United States, there are about 1.1 million people who could benefit from the use of Truvada as PrEP from, as a way of averting HIV seroconversion. And when we look at the numbers on the right, there's about 300,000 white people, 300,000 Latinx people, and 500,000 black people who would benefit from use. But when you look at the percentages, only 1.4% of African Americans, 2.5% of Latinx people, and 14% of whites who would benefit from being on PrEP are actually on PrEP. So there has been a, a steady drumbeat to sort of get this in the hands of people, this medication, but there are numerous factors that are at play that prevent people from taking PrEP. In my own study, the P18 cohort study, which is a study of young MSM, they were MSM when they started. Some of, them some of them transitioned in terms of their gender and gender identity during the course of the 10 years that we worked with them. But almost all of them were aware of PrEP. But only 14% of them had ever used PrEP. Right? This is not gonna be as troubling as the HPV data I'm gonna show you in a little bit. I think that's even more troubling. And we, we see here that while the United States is certainly ahead of all other countries in terms of PrEP initiations, it's still, not, it's still less than ideal. Next generation PrEP, which I think actually holds the most hope, is the use of PrEP, uh, uh, use of PrEP as an injectable. And in 2014, we had actually done a study, actually a study in 2013, that showed by far people preferred an injection over a pill every day. That makes complete sense to me. So as I say to high school students, we have a summer camp at our, at our School of Public Health every summer for high school students, which is really, really fun. Um, kind of amazing, actually, because, um, you know, High school students, nursing, medicine, public health, they don't know the diff, but it's kind of amazing to just be there with them for a week. Um, what was my point here? Uh, my point here is that 
You know, I dream of the day when we have, when somebody goes to their CVS and their Dwayne Reed and they say, you know, I'm going to have a little like, I'm going to have a little flu shot and I'm going to have a little prep shot while I'm at it too. And that will so hopefully be an effective way of averting um, HIV. Uh, Post-exposure prophylaxis, our other tool, the use of medications, post-exposure that you have to be, you have to identify, you have to be identified as being exposed to HIV within 72 hours of, of infection. That's really rough, right? A lot of people don't know. They just, that means, it means, it means that you have to have your wits about you, for lack of a better term, to realize you may have been infected and get to a physician in a quick amount of time to be able to go on PEP. It's a 72-hour thing. For a very long time, PEP was used only in occupational settings. For so, for doctors and nurses and others who have experienced finger, finger sticks or what have you, it is now used, although not frequently, it's not often prescribed, but it's more prescribed for non-occupational exposure to HIV. But the thing that I really want to talk about is the idea of treatment as prevention, because I actually think this is really, really amazing. And now I'll tell you the dopal, I'll tell you the, the, the Brian Gosling doppelganger story, and I use this as an example. So I want you in your mind to put your dream person in your mind. For me, that's Ryan Gosling, okay? <laughs> so, and, you're, and you go out, because he's just so cute and skinny and nice, right? He's just, I just love him. Um, and you, are, you go out, and there's, there's two people there, and they're, they're doppelgangers. They're doubles of each other. There's Ryan Gosling, number one, and Ryan Gosling, number two. And Ryan Gosling, number one, who you're very attracted to, says to you, hey, I'm HIV positive. I'm on meds. I just went to the doctor. I'm like, really, really, I'm, I'm, I'm in totally good shape here, right? I've been living with HIV for 20 years, but my virus is totally suppressed. You're an HIV negative person. And then there's Ryan Gosling, number two, who's like, yeah, yeah, I'm negative. I had like tests two years ago. It's totally good. Now I will, and I, and I present this to my students as, an, as a possibility, which Ryan Gosling is the better choice for you, knowing perfectly well there's not gonna be any condom usage that night, right? Which you giggle, but is often true, right? Because there's also gonna be like seven shots of margarita that have preceded that. So you know there's gonna be no condom usage. And of course it's Ryan Gosling, number one, and I'm being sort of like I'm driving you to this decision point, but this is not a natural way of thinking, or certainly wasn't a natural way of thinking until recently, that an HIV positive person is not a weapon. I think we, 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 we acted HIV, treated HIV positive people as vectors of infection for a very long time. And so the idea that somebody who is on treatment and actually might be a better choice because the positive person is not only on treatment and virally suppressed, but probably is having their other STIs checked at, at also, is a very new concept. And it means that you have to have some cognitive disequilibrium as Piaget said, right? You gotta think things through and then you have to like realign things to realize that this is actually correct. Okay, so you, we, we know of course that sexual transmission of HIV is most likely to occur through receptive anal intercourse with, with other behaviors being extremely low risk, like including oral. And, if an, and the idea here is that if, if an HIV positive person has undetectable viral load, based on the technologies we have which detect virus in the blood, if a person is consistently undetectable, then recent research shows that the HIV transmission risk of that person is zero, right? The problem, of course, what we have with the HIV, with the HIV epidemic in our country is that a lot of, there's a lot of people going around un, untested, infected, who have very high viral load, which makes them very infectious. So treatment as prevention is both a clinical individual health tool but it is also a population and public health tool. It is good for the person who is living with HIV, and it is good for the population if we can get virus suppressed. Okay, so this is a mathematical model from a paper that was published in 2009, and in the, in the, in the three colors you see the red be meaning no intervention, and the green one, that's the one I really wanna point you, which is universal voluntary HIV testing and immediate art. What this mathematical model shows is that if you were to have universal voluntary HIV testing and put people on meds right away, then the incidence of HIV would become extremely low, in fact, significantly lower than if we've had no intervention. So that's one mathematical model. Here is data from British Columbia that shows us that as uh, as look at on the right, on the, and the green is new HIV diagnoses um, at the bottom there, and then the blue is people on ART. 
And so what, we've, what you see in this particular chart is as people on ART is, are going up, new incidence of HIV goes down. And here's our friends in San Francisco who just know everything. And here is a study on community viral load that shows over time as community viral load decreases, and that's the amount of circulating virus in the community, right? right? So if there's less circulating virus in the community, the community viral load is down. And I'll come back to that when I talk about what's going on in the black gay community the incidence of HIV is going, is going down also. So there's been a series, and this is the same sort of idea, but in Denmark. So consistently, we have been able to see through these ecological types of studies, more viral suppression, less HIV incidence. And this is, um, this is also data from New York City that's had a really, 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 really aggressive HIV campaign under the gu guidance of my friend Dimitri Deskalakis, who's also Greek, because you know all Greeks know each other. So, and he's gay Greek, so we really know each other. So <laughs> he's actually he's a fantastic commissioner, um, and he's been really out there. And the diagnosis of HIV have gone really just drastically, drastically down because of the initiation of if, um, testing in like convenient places, the accessibility of PrEP, putting people on medications, and the, the overall the state went down from somewhere like 4,000 cases a, a year a few years ago to about 1,500 last year. That's enormous. That's just, just enormous. And consistently throughout the world, as you see here in this picture and those, I'm sorry for the blurriness, but as the percentage of the population on ART goes up, the incidence of HIV goes down. So lots of ecological studies that support it. You should believe it because I've said it and I've shown you. But now I'm going to show you some other studies, which are behavioral studies. And here's studies from the, a the HPTN study. So these are studies of dyads, of couples, looking at um, seroconversion in couples where there's serodiscordance, one positive, one negative. And in this study, this H HPTN study, there was a 93% um, um, d decrease in HIV transmission from the positive partner to the negative partner, but there was actually zero transmissions when the partner was, was virally suppressed. And the partner study, another study that was published in 2006, um, no documented cases of HIV within the couple during condom sex when the HIV positive person is virally suppressed. And in another study called Opposites Attract, HIV positive on men, men on art with undetectable viral loads do not transmit that to their partners. Now, positive people could have told you this years ago because positive people have been having sex for years, but the literature has finally caught up. So in summary, what we know is that treatment as prevention is actually, from an ecological perspective, point of view and from a behavioral st study point of view, an effective way to, um, to stop the transmission of HIV. So this led to the basis of this statement, U equals U, that I had the great privilege of working on, except the problem is that the Swiss said this like years before the Americans said this. And for those of us who are doing HIV work, HIV work in the field, you'll remember in 2008 the, the drama when this statement, like it was like so much drama, oh, the Swiss, they're being so irresponsible, right? You know, you know, they've stolen all the, the Jewish people's paintings already from like World War II and they're not returning them. And now they're doing this on top of it. So there was a lot of drama there. There's a lot of back and forth. But you know what? They were right. They were totally, totally right when they said an HIV positive individual not suffering from any other STDs and then taking their medication does not transmit the virus sexually. And in fact, this is my buddy Bruce Rickman. HIV positive man, yeah, he's pretty attractive. Um, um, he convened a group of us and we worked together for about a year or two as part of the prevention access campaign to come up with a statement that said this, that people living with HIV and on art with undetectable viral load in their blood have a negligible risk of sexual transmission of HIV. In fact, Bruce will tell you right now, actually, it's zero, and I actually agree it's zero transmission. And finally, after much lobbying, the CDC agreed also in 2017. And since that time, 857 organizations in 98 countries, including the Rutgers School of Public Health, um, including the country of Canada, the whole country, because they have like a Ryan Gosling type prime minister, right? <laughs> um, have endorsed U equals U, right? So that's pretty, pretty incredible that that's happened. So 
that's, wait, let me, wait, that's all fine and good and makes me really, really happy because it, it bestows huge benefits to the psychological health of people living with HIV. It gives us another way of thinking about prevention that's not just about use a condom every time. Every time you have sex, you have to use a condom every single time. Um, but here's the problem. And the problem is this, that when we look at the orange bar on the, or what is that, cream, popsicle color, okay, only 54% of people, this was just reported at CROI, at the CROI conference recently, um, only 54% of Americans are virally suppressed. So it's much worse than the UK, and Kelly will tell you this because she knows she saw this happening. I used to take a class every January when I was at that at NYU when my blood was violet and not scarlet as it is now at Rutgers. And I used to take the kids to uh, London for two weeks to study HIV prevention and counseling. And the reason I did that is because I wanted them to learn how the NHS works. And, 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 and why I wanted them to see why the NH NHS works is because of results like this. They have 84% viral suppression. And why I think that is, is because they, they don't have a fragmented HIV care system. And so when you go to the Mortimer Street Clinic on Tottenham Court Road, are these words meaning anything to you? You know exactly what I'm talking about, right, exactly. On Tottenham Court Road, there's this, this beautiful, cool street in London, um, and you're Soho. There's a doctor and a nurse and a psychologist and a social worker and a patient advocate and daycare and somebody to help you with finances because HIV positive people have all these other aspects of their lives. When you go to the doctor in New York City, it's changing now because Mount Sinai is really changing the game. But for a very long time, if you would go to the, an HIV positive person went to the doctor in New York City and you had, you'd have your regular stuff and you had something different, special, you'd have to be like referred somewhere and people would fall out of care. Mount Sinai is actually changing the game, and Tony Urbina, who you also know, has actually been leading and changing the paradigm in New York City so that everything's contained in one location, which I think also aligns with what we're seeing in New York City. In our own study, and this is my colleague Richard, Richard Green led this analysis of young men who are part of the P18 cohort study, even in our study, which was a cohort study and not an intervention study, but anybody will tell you being part of a study is intervention, has intervention qualities, right? Even though we didn't intend to change behavior, come on. The minute you sit in a room and I ask you about your sexual behaviors, you're gonna, I mean, it somehow affect you. Um, even those folks had a, you know, we only had 54% viral suppression. That's not very good. Okay, so, so what does this say to me? What this says to me is that while biomedical technology, including treatment as prevention, are incredibly wonderful, it doesn't, it only, it's only gonna work if we address the whole person, right? And so ultimately, as I've been talking about for the last 10 or 15 minutes, the goal is to suppress viral load. But one of the great things I had an opportunity to work on was this statement by the American Psychological Association, um, which in 2012, way before everybody was onto this, realized and was afraid, Willow, um, um, Willow Pequinot and others who were on this committee with me were really concerned that in this hoopla about biomedical technologies, we were gonna forget about psychological and behavioral health. And so we put together this resolution that argued that biomedical technologies and behavioral technologies must go hand in hand. Now, I will say to you that that's fine, but there's all these other things too, um, including stigma and discrimination and homophobia and violence that continue to fuel HIV as much as behaviors do and as much as lack of access to medications do. And in fact, like minutes before, I just submitted a grant that is looking at intimate partner violence in relation to viral suppression in gay men because there, there's a relationship there and we need to give clinicians tools to work with that. So, in fact, this idea led me to write this commentary that was just recently published that basically has shown that in, in places like Greece where we have no attention to social circumstances and we have economic conditions that are, that are really falling apart, the health of the population really is, is extremely bad. And after, in Greece, after the economic crash of 2009, there was a 200% spike in HIV infections in the country, right? So if you want more evidence, I mean, there's like, there's like evidence after evidence after evidence that social conditions matter. And so that if we're really effectively going to treat HIV in this country and prevent it, medicines matter, that's great but behaviors matter and social, social factors matter. And a biopsychosocial matter, microbiosocial approach means that health is defined by all these three phenomena. And just 
as you would treat HIV with three different classes of medication, I think we need to do HIV prevention using all three targets here, okay? Behavioral interventions alone are insufficient. I think biological are insufficient alone, but behavioral and, but behavioral and biological are not uh, sufficient also. But combination HIV prevention includes all three. So recently, um, so when I was in New York, I'm still in New York kind of, but I'm in New Jersey too. They're very close to each other. Um, um, when I was in New York, Governor Cuomo um, um, called for an end of AIDS in 2014 by the year 2020, and we got to work on a task force, and we put a plan together, and, you know, and then we just caught on in Jersey. Um, and in Jersey, we're going to bring an end to AIDS by 2025, and our committee is really working to achieve these goals, which is reduce new infections by 75% by 2025, ensure that 100% of persons living with HIV know their status, that's a lofty, lofty goal, and ensure that 90% of persons diagnosed with HIV are virally suppressed. This is a huge problem in New Jersey. It is a very fragmented state. It is like really like there's the north that doesn't trust the south, and the south doesn't trust the north, and it's like a, like a it feels like when I'm driving around there. First of all, I've never spent so much time in a car in my life, but it feels like when I'm driving around there, it's like I'm going from like city state to city state, right? It's like all these little towns that are not connected, but. And that's gonna make this complicated, but we're making every effort to make sure to hit all parts of the state to, like, to drive this message home. And so this strategy that we're putting forward is not just about medications. It's about systems and programs and policies and destigmatizing HIV. Realizing that meds alone and testing alone is not enough. That we have, to have, we have to have systems in place to deliver care effectively. That we have to have programs that support the lives of people. That we have to have policies that protect the rights of people. Right, and that we have to fight stigma. And so when the federal government says we're going to bring an end to AIDS by 2030, which is what they're saying right now, and they're targeting 48 counties, worst affected counties in the country, you can't say that and then allow the religious right to take the right to try to undermine the rights of LGBT people. You can't say that and start trying to defund Planned Parenthood. You can't say that and not let trans people serve in the military, because those are counter to each other. So this idea that you bring an end to AIDS in our country in 2030 while you're undermining the portion of the population, women and, and gay men, who are most affected by HIV by your policies means it's not gonna work. So Orangina can say whatever he wants. It's not gonna work. And we, ha we have to fight for those rights. I'm sorry if I'm offending anybody because of my politics. Okay, I feel like I'm safe. I'm in a blue state. Okay, so uh, addressing the whole person. Now I'm gonna shift gears here on you. So for the last, so this is all my funding for the last few years, yay. Okay, so in the last few years, I've had this great, uh, great honor to work on this study called the P18 cohort study, which is a study, a prospective study of HIV risk in sexual behavior and substance use and mental health in a, in a racially diverse sample of MSM, men of sex with men, lo known locally as the P18 study. Why P18? Because the men, when they started the study, were about 18 years old. I think it was also our 18th study at our center, so we decided to go with P18. Okay. So we wanted to look at, we look at the, and I'll explain these terms in a second, look at risk and protective bases that predict the development of syndemics and to determine how syndemics vary by these moderators. So a few things. Why I wrote this grant originally was because I was tired of HIV prevention efforts being built on people of my generation. And my argument was, well, but there's a whole new generation of gay men who don't look anything like my generation. Right, who, have, who are coming of age at a different time. And so we should follow them and see how HIV is manifesting in their lives. And so we, we follow them, and, we, and, 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 and why I focus on this idea of syndemics is because I believe syndemic, from, from the term multiple epidemics, argues that one health problem is often related to other health, pro health problems. And this was an idea that was postulated by Merrill Singer, who's an anthropologist at the University of Connecticut, and then Ron Stahl sort of implemented it for use in, 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 in MSM and gay men. And the idea is that if you see mental health problems, you tend to see HIV. When you see HIV, you see drug use. And when you see drug use, you see violence, right? And all those things synergize with each other, and they exacerbate each other, right? And so health problems are coexisting. Some people use the term comorbidities, right, to describe that. But health problems do not exist alone. So our study, which started in 2009, um, we recruited people through via active and passive technology uh, techniques. To be in the study, they had to be 18 or just 19 within a month of 19. 
They had to self-report as being HIV negative, and they had to have sex with a man in the last six months. They did not have to identify as gay. They just had to have sex with a man because they're 18 and their identity is developing, so, right? And we, um, we screened people. About half of them were not eligible because they were over the age. We ended up with a sample of 600 people where we had an eight, a prevalence rate of, HI, of, of HIV, of zero prevalence rates of 1% at baseline. The study basically followed the sample over the course of seven assessments through an audio CASI assessment of a variety of different mental health and other measures, a calendar-based technique called the timeline follow-back, which is a pain in the neck but amazing as a way of getting data. For those of you who have not heard of this technique, it's a technique where you put a calendar in front of someone. So let's say I go to the dean and I say, okay, here's, here's April, let's circle all the important days. Oh, my birthday's on the second, and then there's Easter or Passover. You circle all the important dates, and then you work from those dates out, and you determine the sex and the drug use on those dates, and then you fill out the whole calendar. So you have a whole, a whole wonderful story for a month about a person, which is really super cool, and a really effective way of trying to tap into memories about what happens. And this is why I go back to my point earlier, that even though this wasn't an intervention trial, the fact that we're doing this is, in, is intervention E, right? You're like, oh my God, I had so much sex this last week. Like, what happened? And I did way too many drugs that week. Anyway, and then we did pre and post test counseling, we did HIV testing, blah, 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 and urine based drug screening. My team is like so amazing that we had this amazing, amazing retention rate. This has nothing to do with me. This has to do with the fact that, and I was talking about this with the undergrads before, we treat our participants like human beings. We treat like our participants like, like they, they are critically important, that their voices matter. We modify our protocols when we need to, and we did in this case because as we learned as the study was going on, some of the folks were transitioning, so the questions weren't appropriate for them, right? And I know that creates meth methodological and biostatistical messiness, but it's also just life, right? And so, so we wanted to do, so, so thanks to my team, with this hugely, hugely successful retention rate. That's enormous. We're talking about 18 to 21 year olds, right? You know what they're like? Exactly. So this was the sample. We uh, oversampled men of color, so about 30% Latino, regardless of race. Um, uh, about half of them at the time were enrolled in school. We used a measure of perceived familial SES, and you can see that was pretty well distributed. We used the Kinsey scale that one of the undergraduates asked me about before, and I, I said, while not, while not a perfect scale for measuring sexual behavior and sexual orientation, better than having to check a box, right? And what was really interesting is that Alvaro Morera, one of our students, eventually did an analysis, and it was actually able to show, for those of you who don't know what the Kinsey scale is, it, it goes from zero to six, where you're exclusively heterosexual to exclusively homosexual. And as you might imagine, as happens with everything in life, identity develops during emerging adulthood, and they became a little gayer as time went on. <laughs> Did you like the little dance? It's kind of amazing, right? <laughs> so, for <a> very <laughs> so for a very long time, the theory of syndemics, or the, it's not really a theory, the conceptual model of syndemics was based on these additive models, which is like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna measure everything that's gone wrong to you. Like, you're depressed, you use drugs, your parents beat you, you're in a, you have intimate partner violence, you're poor, and I'm gonna tally those together, and I'm gonna give you a risk score, and then I'm gonna show you that that risk score is related to you having unprotected anal intercourse, right? Or condomless sex. And that's fine and good, but that just assumes some equal weighting and addition of risks. And I wanted to do something a little more, a little more, a little more elaborate, which to use as a public health psychologist, use a structural equation model, actually take the variables we measured, develop latent constructs of them, look at their associations, and then we were very glad to do this analysis, and I think we were the first ever to do this analysis. Others have followed who will remain nameless. Um, and what we were able to show very clearly is that, of course, the drug variable is loaded on a factor, and of course, the sex variable is loaded on a factor, and of course, the mental health variable is loaded on a factor, but then the drugs and the sex voted, loaded on a, a mega factor, and that mega factor was related to sex. So it was just like a really, I think, an, um, statistically lovely way to show what everybody had known to be true, but with like a robustness to the analysis that I think gave it a lot of weight. We also looked at incidence of HIV in the sample. So you'll remember of the 600, six were positive at best baseline, but then 540, 594 remained negative, which we followed. 
and about 43 of them, uh, or not about, 43 of them seroconverted over the course of those seven wa waves of data collection, which is an incidence rate of about 7%. That's pretty high, right? Not surprising to any of you, the majority of the individuals who seroconverted were either black, you see that? Either 14 of them were black or thir and 13 were Hispanic, only three of them were white, right? We also looked at familial SES, and not surprising there also, the folks who were in the lower SES also were more likely to seroconvert, okay? So not just about race. And Lisa, our friend Lisa Boleg, who we love, who's an editor at AJPH, who's an amazing public health researcher, actually wrote this really great commentary in the American Journal of Public Health about a month or two ago, where she said she never wants to read another article that talks about race as a predictor of something. And I agree, like stop. It's not about race. It's about a person's race being in a context. It's about the life circumstances of that person. It's not about their skin color. It's not because they're Latino. It's about situational and contextual factors. And by the way, what I say to my students all the time, I can't intervene on race. Like, what am I supposed to do about that? Right? Tell me what's going on for black folks or white folks or Asian folks or other folks so that I can intervene on those aspects of their life and make things better. So hopefully we'll shift the dialogue and get people to do something about that. Okay, sorry for my like little outrage there. But so while, while, while the black guys were more likely to seroconvert than the white guys, what you will see here is that the black guys, and this, you know, those of you who do HIV work know this, the black guys were not having more unprotected sex than the, than the white guys. In fact, only 16% of the black men reported unprotected anal you know, intercourse as compared to 21% of the black men. So this idea that, well, black men are seroconverting because they're having riskier sex and more partners and blah, 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 blah. Let's just let all our racism spew out all over the place has nothing to do with what the phenomenon is there. In fact, further, and I'll come back to my point in a second, um, we did find that people who had started sex earlier were more likely to become HIV positive, no surprise there, right? More, more active sex lives. Um, and also, people who are living in areas that had higher HIV prevalence were more likely to become HIV positive. So the story we told, and the stories that other has, others have told, is the following, and I have a paper that we're working on right now, is the following. Young men tend to sort their sexual partners on race. Black men choose black men, and white men choose white men. Right? Because, you know what? The LGBT population is racist, right? Shocking. <laughs> I know, I wrote an editorial for the New York Star Ledger and people came up to me and said, I had no idea. And I'm like, really? Like, why would like, gay people be different than anybody else? So there's this sorting that goes on. And for the African, and I think that the phenomenon that plays out in the African American population is there, there's more uncontrolled virus. There's higher community viral load. So it's not like you're choosing more partners. You're just having sex with partners who are more likely to be infectious. And as a result, you become HIV positive. And in New York City, there's this very interesting phenomenon that happens. The black and Latino men level off in their 20s, and then there's like this spike in the white guys in their 30s. What's that about? I, I don't understand what that's about. I like to think crystal meth is involved somehow, but stay tuned. I'll do those analyses soon. Not surprising also, as we follow these, peop these folks, drug use increased over time. And not surprising also, you will know, that the, the likelihood of engaging in condomless sex was much, much higher if you were in a relationship. Right? So this idea that casual partners is a risk, and a lot of people have debunked this, is nonsense. Most of the risk is happening in couples. You meet somebody, I love you, you love me, and the condom goes out the window. You know what I'm talking about. And that's exactly what's happening here. And I can tell you that time after time after time, when young guys would be in our center, and they would be, they would, they'd be detected to be positive, it would always come back to like, but I thought my boyfriend and I were like monogamous. It was always the same, not always, but often the same story. So this also, to me, speaks to the debunking of this idea that people are rational operators. Because once love and emotions are involved, rational operations go out the window. Um, this led us to a series of studies that looked at, a series of analyses that looked at intimate partner violence, where we found that gay men in our study were, were as light, had high levels of both victimization and perpetration, and that was related to their, their drug use, particularly their alcohol use. 
and it was related to their sexual behavior. Uh, if you look at the right, uh, the adjusted odds ratios, individuals had experienced any, any, any IPV or victimization or perpetration were more likely to, re to engage in receptive anal intercourse, right? So the dynamics of the relationship. In the second version of the study got funded for another five years, um, we also did, the, as, as before, retained about half the sample for the study, opened it up, got another 300 people, added full-on STI testing, multi-site, you know, mouth, the whole area, and then got funding again from the NIH to do a study of HPV and HSV. Um, one of the analyses that I've done in that one, I really want to get to the HPV stuff and I'm running out of time here. One of the analyses I've done in that one is to look at the life worries. One of the things I kept saying was that for young gay men, HIV is a worry, but not the same worry as it was for my generation. And I did this really cool paper of psychometric analysis of the various worries that they had based on the scale that I, that I developed. And not surprising to any of you, the worries of young gay men were financial or social or self-esteem or physical appearance or physical health, of which HIV was one thing. But HIV was not the only thing that they were worried about. And it wasn't the center of their existence. And this, the problem we have is that we treat people, we treat HIV and we expect people to react like it's 1985. And it's not 1985. I'm gonna move on to that. So let me get to this. So this is the most troubling thing to me. This is a paper that was just published this week where we also looked at HPV exposure. Okay, so about 10 years ago, or is it 10 years ago, maybe longer, 10, 12 years ago, the CDC comes out, you know, with uh, there's Gardasil, you're gonna get, you're gonna, you're gonna get HP, vaccinated for HPV, we recommend that girls get it, nothing to mention of boys, because the girls are gonna get it from the sky somehow, it's gonna fall down, and they're gonna get HPV, <laughs> right, <laughs> right. Ooh, surprise! And then all of a sudden, the, C the CDC wakes up and says, well, we better say something about boys, too, okay. So we did an we, we, we used these, these technologies here where we tested um, for oral HPV exposure and for anal HPV exposure with swabs and rinses, and we test for 50 different, 52 types of HPV that the participants could be exposed to. This was an ancillary study to the cohort study. And this was how old the guys were. They, we followed them during their visits. They were 24, 25, and 26. We're still in the process of collecting these data. And we also did a qualitative component where we interviewed 40, 40 guys about their knowledge of HPV and of a vaccination. Ha, wow, only 18% of them are fully vaccinated. These are 22 year olds, 18%. They were certainly of age at the time when the vaccine was available. So 46% uh, of them not vaccinated at all. 25% of them went for one shot or maybe two shots, which may have some effectiveness, but not all three. And 11% didn't even know what we were talking about. And when we looked at vaccination, which is interesting to me, there were no differences by race, ethnicity. And this actually makes sense to me because when you look at the HIV epidemic, you know, early on um, in, in the 80s, it equal opportunity distributor. Everybody gets it. Yeah. But you look at HIV now, you're a black gay man, you're much more likely to be HIV become HIV positive than a white gay man. But here, I think it's the same thing. It's like this behavior, this phenomenon that is equally present across races. Um, and when we ask them why they're not vaccinated, three things came up. Oh, the cost. I was told I was going to have to pay something like $250. Uh, mental medical trust, I haven't gotten it because I personally don't really trust a lot of medicines. And the female focus, uh, it was really just marketed at young girls. Like, you protect your daughters from cervical cancer. They get the HPV vaccine. I can't tell you the number of times we heard in the interviews, oh, I don't have sex with women. Okay, so what, what is the CDC doing about this? Right? This is intensely problematic. More, more evidence from the qualitative interviews. The virus only targets women. Even if a man got it, it wouldn't affect them. It's just like if you're gay, you're gonna sleep with women? If you're not, then you don't have to worry. Or I know that HPV increases certain types of cancer. It increases forms of cancer associated with the female reproductive system. How much misinformation is going on here, right? And what, how much work, like here is like, we're like a ground zero here for like knowledge. So if anybody wants to do an HPV knowledge program, this is the, your ammunition for doing it. When we looked at exposure to uh, HPV, anal HPV, oral HPV, uh, vaccine preventable HPV, or any HPV, both poverty, 
and more importantly, HIV status was related to it. And now here is the problem with all of that. The problem with that is that if you're HIV positive, it is very difficult for you to clear HPV. And so doctors like Stephen Goldstone and others in New York City are increasingly seeing the development of anal cancer in HIV positive pop pop people. Because one, their health care providers are not doing appropriate testing on them, including pap smears. Two, they're not presenting to their doctors when they have risks like lumps and bleeding. And by the time they get there, they have cancer. Now, fortunately, anal cancer is treatable. It's a lot more complicated when you're HIV positive and your immune system's already compromised. So go get your boys vaccinated. Or as I want to say to the CDC commercial, add the tagline, especially your gay boys. Okay, so let me just wrap it up here for you. About six years ago, I had the great privilege of writing this article with Rich Woliski at the CDC and Greg Millett that sort of, sort of framed our understanding of HIV within the larger syndemic model, where we understand HIV to be part of many, a part of a multitude of health problems being faced by gay men, and that these, these problems are driven by biological, behavioral, and social and structural factors. And in fact, a lot of that a lot of those ideas were inspired by this Institute of Medicine, which we now call the National Academies of Medicine, report that talked about the disparities that exist for LGBTQ people in terms of health. Um, sexuality and sexual behavior must be at the center of treatment and care for, H for, for LGBTQ people, yet even, even the most progressive modern of doctors in that awesome city of mine, New York, do not have conversations with their patients about sex. This is how it goes. You use a condom every time, right? You're not doing meth, right? <laughs> oh, I can't do an HPV, I can't do a pap smear, you have to go like there. That's New York City. So you can imagine Mississippi, no, I'm, I'm not slurring Mississippi, but you know, bad things happen in Mississippi. So if that's happening in New York City, it's certainly, you know, it's happening much worse in Mississippi. So, you know, in some ways, I actually wrote this editorial that's about to appear in AJPH called The Stonewall Riots, The AIDS Epidemic in the Public Health, where I argue that actually the way we think about health equity and social justice in public health is in, in fact has a lot to do with the AIDS epidemic and the things we fought for in the 1980s. But in fact, you know, the AIDS epidemic partially happened in response to a healthcare population, a healthcare industry that wasn't prepared to deal with the health of gay people. So when we presented all of a sudden with this disease, they didn't know what to do. Um, finally, I want to point your attention to this amazing, amazing, amazing report that I had the opportunity to work on in the American Psychological Association on the health disparities in racial, ethnic, and sexual minority boys and men, where we really talk about the social drivers of disease in this population, including the role that hypermasculinity, hegemonic masculinity, toxic masculinity, masculinity so fragile, has not only in perpetuating harassing behaviors that men impose on women and men impose on other men, but also how these hypermasculine conceptions affect the individual health of, the, of, of people, of, of men. Um, it's a great chapter in the book about hypermasculinity. One of my favorite. The racism chapter and the hypermasculinity chapter are my, my favorite chapters of the book. So, all of this, I'm wrapping up here, led us to the development of the intervention. What you're seeing on the right there are all the papers we studied because, oh yeah, when we get NIH grants at our center, we actually write papers like you're supposed to. <laughs> that's, the, that's the lesson, people on review panels. Um, and what we saw, based on our papers, was the potential of creating an adaptive intervention, a tailored intervention that was based on four components, health activation, patient navigation, the use of SMS technology, and mindfulness training. And for those of you who like that, one of my favorite apps is called Budify. So every day, like at 12, 31 o'clock, I close my door and I bootify myself a little bit, like for eight to 10 minutes. It just helps me center, right? Because it prevents me from, Hillary knows, it prevents me from like screaming at people, trying to fire them. So we've, de so we've developed this form our intervention. We just wrote a grant. You know, we're gonna have to revise it, but I think this is, we're, we're, we're piloting it right now. This is what we're trying to do as our next step based on the P18 study. We feel like we have enough data now to have developed, developed this intervention, which is also based on the unified theory. And you know, my, as Hillary said, my book is coming out, and I, I just want to read you a quote from it. The work we undertake regarding the health of gay men in the United States must continue to evolve. 
It is no coincidence that gay men continue to experience health disparities, whether HIV, substance abuse, depression, or a myriad of other problems, due, almost da to, due to almost daily discrimination in the form of macro and, ma and ma macro, ma macro and microaggressions. And I actually think I'm going to start to use the term mesoaggressions, because I think they exist too. Let's, let's go with that. Let's just start using it. Like any marginalized group, the situation takes its toll on our well-being, right? Gay men are just not unhealthy for no reason at all. Black folk aren't unhealthy for no reason at all, right? It's like this is happening because social conditions fuel these health issues. So there I am, kind of. If you, you can follow me on the gram or on the Twitter or on the website, and it's been my great honor presenting to you this afternoon. Thank you. We, have, we can take numerous questions, arguments, rebuttals, ETC. What are you talking about, Halkidis? You're out of your mind. I have a question. Yes, Kelly Green. Um, so, oh, great. Wow, very exciting. Um, can you talk a little bit about the cohort of folks that you had that were HIV positive that were not actually on meds? Like, were you able to have qualitative interviews with them and figure out why? Because especially with a cohort that's coming to you and who's actively involving themselves in HIV research, the yes. fact that only 54% of them were on yes. meds yes. is very troubling. Yes, so two main reasons played out. Denial of their HIV status because they were afraid they would be re rejected by sexual partners, not people wanting to know, which by the way is also the reason some of the men avoided PrEP because they thought if they were on PrEP, people would think they were HIV positive. And two, access to in, failure to access adequate health care. Not because Obamacare didn't provide them care, just because they didn't know where to go for care. They couldn't navigate the system. This is why we, we put patient navigation in there. Because they just didn't need to go, right? The ones who we would follow and who actually connected with us regularly and would per positive and we would help them with their doctors and help them with their appointments, they, they were suppressed. That's what happened. Come up. Come on. Yeah. Great hat. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you. And thank you for all this knowledge. It's um, really brilliant. Um, oh, thank you. And You're making my mother and father proud. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I'm a nurse, and I, I maybe thought I was going to go this direction in my career, but have not, and have ended up... Um, with another population, I, I did work with uh, people with AIDS as a nursing assistant certified in the early 90s. Um, but I find myself working with children with medical complexity now, and I can't stop drawing parallels with this population and the population I currently work with. And I'm just looking for a little hope. There's always hope. I, I think you have. For, so the reason, that the, the last book, th first of all, thank you for your work, and thank you for your care and your love to the, the folks you work with. Look, the last book I wrote before this book, book number four, Hillary, uh, <laughs> was called the, Age, the AIDS Generation, Stories of Survival and Resilience. And the reason I wrote that book is because I, wa I wanted to say that there was hope, that it was really, really bleak and horrible, but out of that also came these really beautiful lives, right? And that the... I remember interviewing those guys for the book and saying, that, and, so there's, there's, and, and them saying, I don't know what my, I have no legacy. I, I lost my job. I, I didn't know what to do. I'm like, no, your legacy is you survived and you are thriving. And so I say, use that mindset because there, there, there is hope. And who would have thought 30 something years ago we'd be telling people, oh, yeah, take a pill every day and you won't get HIV? Just think about that for a second. When in 1981, 1982, we were all, not you, but I and others were walking around going, what is going on here? And people are like, oh, it's poppers. D does everybody know what poppers is in Halo 9? Oh, good, good. It's, it's, yeah, it's Washington. You know these things, right? So, and it was like, <laughs> and it was poppers, but not, it was poppers because it was sex, right? And people, that's what it was. But the confusion and the chaos, and in three decades, three decades, as much as we might hate the pharmaceuticals, and some people do, the advances, are remarkable to me. So I think there's always hope. Yeah. There has to be hope. It, I just feel like there, there could be, like I could learn from the structure of the success that, that you've had with treatment and apply it to what I'm doing. Yeah, I think you can. I think, look, in the same way, I keep saying to the prep people, not the, who are the prep people? 
I don't know, the prep people. <laughs> you know them. That you, why aren't we like, and Dimitri will say this too, it's like in the early 70s when birth control became available for women, there wasn't this rapid uptake of the, of the pill. Right. That happened over time. Why aren't we using, why aren't we using lessons of the past to inform how we do work well? I'm saying that, I'm just, and I'm thinking what's going on in the country. But so, but there are models there. And so, yes, I think you're absolutely, and I don't think health problems are like so disconnected from each other, right? You know, when you think about adherence behavior for cholesterol medication or adherence behavior for diabetes, and you think about adherence behavior for HIV meds, these are, these are just behaviors, right? And it doesn't really matter what the disease state is. So, yeah, thank you, and thank you for your work. Do we have anyone who wants to ask one last question? Okay, I'm gonna scooch past you, sorry. Who saw me on TV today? Yay! <laughs> All right, so you mentioned a little bit um, about one of your studies that you're doing that you're thinking crystal meth might be behind. Yes. Why uh, is there such a high use in white MSM? Oh my God, do we have five hours? I know, I know. <laughs> so book number three, <laughs> also available on Amazon, um, is about meth. Okay, so why do I think meth use is so prevalent? And I actually wrote an editorial for the Philly Enquirer recently where I said, can we stop focusing on opioids and realize that there's a, there's a meth problem still? Just because it's not like white suburban kids. Meth use and gay men. Why do I think it's used? One, because I think that it creates great social, it de decreases the social inhibition of gay men. I think, it is extreme, I think it is extremely difficult for young gay men particularly to socialize in, in the spaces and meet partners when they don't know, they're not equipped to know how to do that. Number two, because we're raised by straight parents, right? And so they didn't teach us how to do that. And we're not taught in sex ed, right? I was saying to somebody before, like when they were talking about like straight sex and sex ed, I was like, I don't, I'm not paying attention. I don't care. Number two, equally responsible, the gay community. The gay community is, has these objectified demands of what you're supposed to look like to be A-list. And if you don't have pecs, or, right? I actually think your generation is about this, but for my generation and the generation before, if you didn't look a certain way and have a certain kind of, you were rejected. There was a rejection that went on. So that's number, number two. And I think number three, there's a desire for a fantastical sex that is given by this drug and once somebody gets on it, there is, there is an addiction to it because the sex seems like it's the greatest thing that's ever happened. So those are my behavioral sort of social explanations. Here's my other, my biological explanation. Because they have faulty dopamine production in their brain. And when you have faulty dopamine production in your brain, you probably should be in, on some kind of antidepressant to regulate the dopamine in your brain. And what meth does is it, at least temporarily, makes the dopamine work properly in your brain. So that's what's going on. And so when you do that, when you use meth, what ends up happening is, yes, you have much more partners, you have many more partners, you tend to have more aggressive types of sex, right? There's dehydration of the mouth, which tips rid of the saliva, which makes oral sex a potential risk factor. There's cuts in stuff. It knows that we know it affects adherence to HIV medications, and we know from at least one study published in 2002 and probably others since then that it increases viral replication in the brain. So all of that makes meth a lubricator for HIV transmission. But it's not just meth, and you know the, the other problem is that folks who are using meth are also using drugs and using poppers and they're using K and they're using other things. It's not just, it's always poly drug use. So, yeah. No, in fact, at the Newark Public Library, which is beautiful, by the way, um, so one of the things we do really effectively at our research center is like, and Kelly knows this because she was part of it, is that we are really engaged with and for the populations that we study. And so we had a screening about a month ago of a movie called Party Boy, P-A-R-T-Y, P-A-R-T-Y-B-O-I, which is about black men using meth. And actually, if you look at the data now, and I said this in 2003, and I'm sorry I said it, but it was true that it's mostly positive men and black men who are now actually using meth. And it is not surprising to me to see it among positive men because it is another way of coping with HIV status. And for black men, often too often who are marginalized because of their gay identity or their zero status or their economic status or what have you, who are forcing, facing multiple forms of marginalization, this drug is a great escape. 
and that's why people, you know, and that's why I think it's, a, it's, it's, it's lodged itself there. So there's definitely an uptick in meth use again, and there's actually some evidence there's an uptick in injection use among gay men, which is going to present a problem for HCV and HIV and others, and meningitis and all those other things that are going on. Because if it's not just one virus we're controlling, there's another virus that's going to pop up. In addition to, like, the untreatable gonorrhea that's out there. Yeah. You guys are great. Thank you. <laughs> Awesome. So I wanted to thank you. Um, I know people are taken off, um, but this was just, it was a great example of why bringing together the nursing community, the social work community, the public health community to take a like whole person approach yeah. is really the, the way of the future and the path for it. So thank you, Perry. A little gift for you. Thank, thank you, you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for being such a great audience, you guys.